Just because I, I, have, I have a disability, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean I can't become who I am. I want I want to live as a free man. I want to get married, and I want to have kids one day. I don't want to I don't want to live the rest of my life being controlled by a third party stranger. I have fears at night, thinking that they're gonna to come to the house and take me out, to remove, remove me from my home, my family. I feel it's, it's very scary, because this could, could happen to anyone. Guardianship is a proceeding in state courts when someone is appointed to make decisions for somebody else on the theory that the person with a disability is un unable to make his or her own decisions. It's not a federal system, it's not a national system. Every state has their own criteria, their own rules, their own procedures, their own ways of doing it. The results are pretty much the same for everybody. It can happen to a person who has absolutely no money, not a red cent. A person who's homeless, it can happen to a billionaire. The system has been around for decades, and you know we've had a growing awareness in America about the rights of people with disabilities, about treating them as full human beings, about respecting their abilities rather than focusing on their disabilities, uh, deinstitutionalization of people who are in institutions. This has all been happening since the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and beyond. It's been a, a growing uh, awareness in society, and these laws are relics of the past. We have looked for attorneys to take on these types of cases for David, on behalf of David, for the last seven years. Seven years. The only attorney in the country who stepped up to this issue, Tom Coleman. You know, when I first started out my law practice, for many years, 50% of what I did was pro bono. I think my first year of law practice I brought in $4,000 of income. <laughs> but there was a need, and then another need, and another need. And I, I, I could see it, I could spot it, I could identify it. And I had the time, and I had the interest, and my heart had been touched. How are you doing? How you doing good? What's going on here? Guardianship. That's the problem. And the guardianship courts are not obeying the law, which innocently I always thought they were. And so we're fighting to. We got to educate you. Yes, we do. That's all there is to it. And with Nora as a colleague, I've got someone I can brainstorm with every day, and we talk almost every day. People write from all over the nation, can you help? So I think it was three years ago or something, I got an email from somebody who said, I need some help. I've, I've contacted APS and I've contacted the sheriff and I, my brother is being physically abused in here in LA County. I'm afraid he's gonna die. I need your help. And the brother had sent photos of his wow. brother nearly naked with handcuffs around his ankles and around his arms. The and brother who is doing this to him. You could see my father and mother, they didn't care for him. You could see just how they would talk that he was a burden. I mean he's at a three or four year old level. I could just imagine someone attacking you and you don't know what to do. He would call out for help. It was in the neighbors heard him. It was in these records and Nobody helped him. Yeah, so this is the house. Which one right here? Right here. His room was right there. Oh, the blue one? Yeah. Sickening to be here, just thinking what was happening in that house. Just, I don't even like being here, just knowing what was going on there. I was seeing signs, but I was starting to question, you know, how can I say this? I don't really have evidence. And at this time, I was actually able to get a picture of him in handcuffs because they would put him in handcuffs and they would throw him outside. And they actually, that's how they would clean him. They would hose him off. And I, I asked him, why are you doing this? And he, he stated to me, because he's violent. He's so going to attack me. Oh, I witnessed it. I witnessed it. 
And finally, when I was able to get in contact with Nora, she was able to get to the right people for something to happen and finally to get him removed. My concern was why aren't the existing agencies providing the help that's necessary. The email that we got said, I've contacted APS three times, I've contacted Sheriff three times, they've all gone out. So a total of six possible contacts by APS and law enforcement. Apparently they did not do their job because they didn't find an, an incredibly emaciated person with evidence of physical abuse. Nora and I said, we're going to the media with this if he isn't removed within 24 hours. He got removed. He got sent to the hospital. The court sent an investigator to investigate the allegations of abuse and didn't do a proper investigation, as a result of which the court allowed him to be released by the hospital back to the home. And a few weeks later, he was dead. If someone would have said enough was enough, it stopped it, and not let him go back, let him heal. There's no reason he should have died. 36 years of age, there's no reason he should have. With the general conservatorship, there's no report assessment required by the regional center, and also no court-appointed attorney. So the attorney, the client goes into a court and people are proposing that that person will be conserved and the petitioners have an attorney and the court has a judge, and the client has no one representing their rights. So that's what happens in 80% of the cases for our, my regional center, for their clients. And it's different from what happens in a limited conservatorship where they're automatically appointed a court-appointed attorney. You think that would be enough? At least the court-appointed attorney would be sufficient to guarantee, uh, protect our clients' rights, but in, in my experience, that is not the case. Um, these are attorneys who don't have any specific training with individuals with developmental disabilities, how to interview them, what their abilities, disabilities are, and they don't, in my experience, tend to fight hard to um, help the clients retain their own civil rights, which my understanding, if it's that's your attorney, in a conservatorship process, that, that would be the role of a court-appointed attorney. We are here today to file a complaint with the United States Department of Justice. The complaint alleges that thousands of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Los Angeles County have been denied the right to vote because of actions by the judges of the Los Angeles Superior Court Probate Division and, sad to say, the attorneys that they appoint to represent the people with disabilities. We'd like a task force to look into the entire limited conservatorship system, not just the voting rights violation part of it, but many other rights are being violated. This is the letter to Barbara Boxer. This is the complaint that's okay. being filed. What, what kind of timeline do you expect for something to happen? What, what message do you want to send to those judges? Are you angry at them? Well, I just think that for, for myself, I think it's important that other parents know. My name is Teresa Thompson. I'm the proud mother of a handsome 20-year-old young man who was diagnosed with severe autism when he was about two years old. When I went to court to fill out the papers, I was told I could and should come to a group workshop where all the other potential conservators would come and we would all learn the ropes about what we needed to do to complete the process. The young lawyer who ran the workshop had a PowerPoint presentation that showed us all how to fill out our forms. We all followed along and marked the boxes we had to check off. But I did not realize that by checking off a box indicating my son could not fill out a registration form, that I was declaring that I thought he was incapable of voting. This was not my intent. Autism is a broad spectrum, and there can be low skills and there can be high skills. But what I observed was that people tend to just dismiss it as though they have no skills 
and the other people dismiss that they have no feelings. And this seems to be all too common. Welcome to Yay. San Francisco. Yay. Good to be here too. Yeah. Yeah, they all have a copy of the resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Probate and Mental Health Advisory Committee recommends that the Judicial Council create a statewide task force on limited conservatorships that would operate in a manner consistent with the proposal of the Disability and Abuse Project. Be it further resolved that the Judicial Council should make any modifications to that proposal that it or the Chief Justice deem necessary and appropriate. So tweak it if you want. Change the world from here. Well, that's what we're trying to do right here. We had a pretty good core representative group to go up to meet at the judicial headquarters of the state of California with 15 member probate and mental health advisory committee made up of judges and attorneys. They had allocated 20 minutes for our presentation. By the time it was all over, it was an hour long segment on their agenda. We're not gonna get what we want, but they're gonna work with us on some of the key areas. So it's a partial loaf. Uh, you know, I'm not completely disappointed, but I'm not jumping for joy. It's a lot more work for us. After we had filed a complaint with the Department of Justice two years ago, the California legislature responded by passing SB 589, which went into effect this January, changes everything. It says that if somebody can express a desire to vote, they have a right to vote. The judges can no longer take their right away in these conservatorship cases. I went down to San Diego after I got a call from a woman saying her fiance was stripped of his right to vote in a conservatorship case in 2011, and he wanted his right to vote reinstored so that he could vote in this upcoming election. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up, get up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. For 32 years, David and I have been friends, confidants, and citizens of the mind and the world. For the past eight years, we've been engaged to marry. David holds a political science degree from the University of the District of Columbia. He worked as a news producer for National Public Radio headquarters in Washington, D.C. for three decades before falling ill in 2009. It's not something that's limited to a particular class or race or group of people guardianship, things that happen to people because of their health, just happen. It's our system that makes it so difficult to deal with in the aftermath. To put the burden on people with disabilities to learn about this, to act on this on their own, that itself is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The court should be reaching out to them. Dear Judge Kennedy, pursuant to California Senate Bill 589, I want my voting rights restored immediately. The Registrar of voter, Voters needs my name on the restored list before October 24th so that I may vote in the general November election. Please send me a copy of the order restoring my voting rights. I would like communication through Rosalind Alexander Kasparik, my conservator of the person, with how you intend to proceed. Sincerely, David Rector. Under the ADA, the burden is on the court.
This has got your name on it, Stephen Ray Lopate, and your address. And what we decided, what you wanted to vote for, okay? So we waited a long time for this to happen. Greg, this is Mr. Ed Asner. So, Greg Deemer. And his mother, Linda, right here. No, this is my mom. Yes. I know my mom. Yes. yes. Just, I, have two. I feel better with mom on the spectrum. I feel comfy with you, mom. You sure do. You're being great. Gregory Deemer is a young man with autism who is 28 years old. He was placed in a limited conservatorship 10 years ago. What's he doing now? Well, he has two small part-time jobs. He's been working at the restaurant Spitfire Grill at the Santa Monica Airport. He's been doing that for 13 years. Linda Deemer, who is the parent, she's been advocating for his constitutional rights for many years. His own attorney should have been advocating for him, but that right has been chipped away by the court with the cooperation of his own court-appointed attorney. And he has now totally lost the right to make decisions as to where he goes, what he does, who he sees, who he doesn't see. I looked into 30 organizations that uh, describe themselves as taking care of disability rights. Uh, about half of them uh, regional, half of them national. I made labels because of sending letters to them trying to ask for help. I actually have three binders filled with the communications that I've tried to have with these groups. And pretty much everybody out of all the 30 groups were saying there's nothing that we can do to help. And so mainly what I was finding is that everybody seems to think that everybody else is taking care of it. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. <laughs> The practices of the court-appointed attorneys have been violating the Americans with Disabilities Act that requires that they assist their client to have access to justice and assist their clients to have meaningful participation in their cases. And many of them are putting in as few as five hours on a case, a case that's so crucial where critical fundamental rights will be taken away from their clients and yet they're handling the cases like they're on an assembly line. I talked to 52 attorneys, 52. And I went to the judge and I said, I talked to 52 attorneys. So she gave me three more and they all said no too. The LA County Bar Association had started doing a PVP limited conservatorship training. One I attended in person, one was by webinar, were of limited value to me because it mostly just covered the law. Um, in terms of what you're supposed to do. It doesn't cover the law in terms of what your client's rights are. It doesn't cover the law in terms of ADA. It doesn't do things to teach people about the specific disabilities that your clients have and how that can impact their ability to not only communicate, um, but also how it impacts their rights. We dropped off complaints against the LA Superior Court about the way that it's handling the court-appointed lawyer system and how its failure to operate that system in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act is harming uh, people with developmental disabilities. So we got that done. Yay! Yay! I got a telephone call about the adult guardianship system in Washington State. She says, I've been watching what you and Nora have been doing on the conservatorship project in California, and I'm just in awe, but the problems exist throughout the nation. And in Washington State, I can tell you firsthand, because my daughter 
has been stolen from me by that system. My daughter is 46 and the guardianship was created 28 years ago, but problems didn't occur until 2007. In my daughter's case, she was declared incapacitated and her father and I were appointed full co-guardians in response to my attempting to assist her in self-advocating for appropriate and professional services. Care providers filed two referrals to Adult Protective Services. They alleged neglect and abuse and that I was limiting her freedom and independence. Tom is giving out a packet. For well, I'm going to get out 10 packets. 10 packets for the Supreme Court justices. APS referred the case on to the court for review. The court removed me and appointed a certified professional guardian. Over a period of two years, my daughter was allowed to see me and my family 32 hours. Hello. Hi. I'm going around dropping off some literature for the senators. This was in a monitored public setting and for no more than two hours. I'm addressing anybody, including legislators, judges, attorneys, with the intent to help them understand what has happened to people with disabilities when they encounter the guardianship process, either when the guardianship is being set up or when problems arise. Hey, no, no. In Washington, the appointment of representation for the person with developmental disabilities is not mandatory. Washington State needs to change that law. Then there are links to down, uh, download. My daughter is not happy. She wants her independence. She wants to be able to choose. When she sees me and my maternal family, she has asked me, Mom, did I do something wrong? She has been told that her contact with me is a result of her behavior problems. I am still in litigation. First of all, you all know that I didn't ever think I was going to be in this arena, but I'm really trying to make the best of it. I mean, the horrible circumstances, as you know, I can barely get through these talks, but I keep at it because I feel compelled. After that testimony before the U.S. Senate Special Committee, it's just that I have to do more. Cool. We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah. There are no ADA standards for guardianship and, guardi and guardianship attorneys. Mm -hmm. So I created them. Oh. Oh. So this white paper, this you can see is uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. And then we, we actually come down to uh, five pages. Uh, there's probably about 15 standards mm -hmm. for court appointed attorneys and what the courts have to do. Uh, if their advocacy is going to be compliant with the ADA. Yeah. Now, all of this would apply to seniors with mm -hmm. cognitive disabilities in guardianships mm -hmm. equally. I have not heard anybody construct, sort of take this systems-based approach, pinpoint what can be the catalyst for change. Because yeah. everybody takes this broad view. And yeah. then I will say, I'll do the same thing. Yeah. And then actually spot on and then head up to the top right away. I was a designated conservatorship report writer where I was responsible for making assessments to the courts on whether or not the regional center agreed on whether or not this individual would need a conservatorship and if so, what areas they might need assistance. 
we received specialized training on conservatorships. We had to go meet the families, meet the client, ask certain questions. We just had a very strict policy that we had to follow. Fast forward, I went to another regional center and the conservatorship process was very different. There was not individualized training on this policy. Some of my coworkers didn't know what conservatorships were, even though they were making recommendations to the court. There was just a complete difference in how this was approached. And what I saw was that the clients had different levels of representation, which impacted the final decisions of the conservatorship. So I saw more people being conserved that didn't need to be conserved. And I saw some people who really needed conservatorship that weren't being placed under those conservatorships. I did my master's thesis on this and interviewed 16 of the 21 regional centers with the survey. And really, they're all doing it so differently. There's no guidelines, there's no monitoring of how each of these agencies is following through with the regulations that they need to report to the courts. You know, Nora and I have talked about this for years. Policy is great if the policy is great. And policy doesn't mean anything unless it's implemented. But how do you know that it's being implemented properly? Nora? Monitoring. Monitoring, yes. So we have reached out to every state or local official and some federal officials about reform of the conservatorship system and the need for greater protection of the rights of people, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Generally, the response has been silence, denial, avoidance, or delay. We now know that you cannot trust the judiciary to do the right thing without monitoring, and so we need some corrections to be made. And, Your Honor, uh, Mr. Governor, we need your support to help us clean this up. see the National Disability Rights Network sponsoring a all-day institute on guardianship reform is historic. For leaders, national leaders, to get up and say, hey, there are maybe one or two good things about guardianship. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe one or two. That's rather indicting. <laughs> we want to keep elevating this oh, still yes. within Nevada, Nora, because it, you know we got five new laws passed. We got three judges transferred to new duties. None of them fired. And to mm -hmm. me, they should have been removed for what they sponsored for wow. almost two decades. But it's going back to the way it was already. What happens in Texas is that when the youth is turning 18, at 17, the rights, they, they give them notice of the transfer of rights under IDEA. And the schools tell the families, you need to get a guardian. And so we've been going and training the schools, families, and, and the youth about the alternatives to guardianship, supported decision making. And so, we're, and we just got a bill passed, the session, that now is mandated to Texas Education Agency in the forms that they give to the families and the youth regarding transfer of rights, yeah. it's going to talk about supported decision making. Oh, good. And so we're, we're starting to, to try to spread the word, but we're representing more youth yeah. in, in getting to avoid guardianships. Wow. Yeah. Good so, job. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you know, you. it's a model for others, you know, to build on, right. to look at, to build on, adapt to their own state right. with their own nuances of each state, but at least you've got something there that people can, they don't have to start from scratch. Right. right. Wow. And I think if we can do this in Texas, yeah, yeah. you could do it anywhere. Yes, that's true. You know, it's because not a partisan it, issue. No. I don't want to live the rest of my life with somebody telling me you can't do this or you can't do that. I want to have my free will as an American. I want it to live the free quality life as all adults do. And there's no reason why I shouldn't have that quality of life. 
and for these strangers to come in and, and, and take my freedom away from me, for, for what? Because they, they I have money that was awarded to me? If I feel in my heart that if I had no money, I feel that these people wouldn't care about me. They wouldn't care. Because all they care about is one thing, dollar, dollar. This woman says to the judge on the record that all people with cerebral palsy need a guardian to control their lives, and that's not true. This woman doesn't even know me. She doesn't know me, and I don't know her. She's just some stranger that was, that was appointed as a petitioner's attorney to just come in and just, just file a petition against me and just destroy my life. Any of us who've been drawn into a guardianship, an involuntary guardianship, yeah. everybody tells you this is good for you. Yeah. We're, we're helping you. The judge is with you. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, this judge gets it. You just got to be patient. It's going to cost you a little bit, but it'll be good in the end. And a year later, we lost my wife's dad. And a year after that, our tally was a million dollars. And he died in the home of his exploiter, who's now convicted. I mean, you can't make this up, but there were five attorneys telling me the whole, and a private professional oh, guardian. It'll be good in saying, the end. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for your dad. Trust me. The United States Department of Justice issued a guidance memo about the application of the ADA to criminal justice proceedings. So we're saying that was a great start, but now we need something ab uh, about the ADA and how it applies to guardianship proceedings. It's the first meeting of its kind with the Department of Justice on this topic, and we're hoping that um, they do the right thing and sometime in the near future such a guidance memo is issued. We're off to the Capitol to meet with a member of Congress about a pending bill dealing with guardianship and abuse. Rick Black has set up the meetings, and this will be our first of many meetings today and tomorrow. We want the, the, the bills S-178-1 and S-182. Right now, they're focused on elders and elder abuse and elders in guardianship. We want both the House bill, the companion bill, if it's introduced, and the Senate bills to be broadened to include elders and dependent adults so that adults with developmental disabilities fall under the same protections. It's the same issues, That's right. That's right. so there's no reason why it shouldn't be both. One provision of it directs the Department of Justice to create best practices guidance for the state guardianship systems to improve them. So that's our hook. That's what we're going to work on to try and move forward there. Mountains and clouds. Interesting. I'm speaking out to add my voice to chorus who are complaining about guardianship services across the United States. It is only by telling stories such as mine and advocating for the rights of people with disabilities that systemic changes will occur. Every part of the system is failing. It hasn't been reviewed in the 30 years that it's been operating since the legislature created it. We want to go working with the system to have the system acknowledge this themselves and then start implementing reforms. That's our preferred method, but we're not letting go until this is fixed, period. Let's hit the road. Yay.